We're going to first have uh, Professor Corey Marsh come up. Now, Corey Marsh is known for being very uh, dispassionate, not having a lot of passion, not having a lot of zeal when it comes to the Lord and to the Word. It's kind of just the opposite. Corey, is a, a, he's, a, he's a great treasure that we have. He's someone who just is crazy in love with Jesus, and he has just a, an amazing commitment to biblical truth. And so uh, Dr. Corey Marsh is going to be presenting on something that you may have done a little bit of study in, and that's the Christological Doxology Through Suffering, a hermeneutical case study of John 9 concerning physical handicaps. So, uh, Professor Marsh, please, welcome. Thank you, Gino. I'm glad you got rest yesterday. It was wonderfully encouraging to hear. <clears throat> well, uh, before we get started, um, today, as, as Gino just brought up, these are scholarly presentations. So there's going to be some technical stuff. Um, hopefully we won't get too lost in the weeds. Um, so it should be okay uh, for the majority of everybody here. But specifically, the target audience is the Doctrine of Ministry students. So it's geared toward a more academic level. And uh, myself, Dr. Crocker, Dr. Miller, the presentations we're doing are based on exegesis and hermeneutics. At least it centers on these topics somehow in different nuances. And before I get started, I wanted to uh, do a shameless plug um, for the school and for books that we have at SCS Press. Uh, we have a publishing arm at Southern California Seminary, and we are making a mark, a pretty sizable mark in the academic publishing field now, which is great. Most of you, well, I, I don't know most of you, actually, I shouldn't say that. Some of you, I know, um, already have one of our publications. This is our flagship book, and it's over there on the table. Um, <clears throat> because we're dealing with hermeneutics today and exegesis, we wrote a book in celebration of the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation in October. And there's about 15 different scholars here. All of our chapters, myself, I'm on this, Dr. Fazio, Dr. Muti over here, we all have essays and articles here along with other scholars um, promoting the fact that it is dispensational thought that is best, most consistently advanced uh, Reformation theology. You know, it's like the five solas, specifically sola scriptura. So a lot of the chapters in this have to do with hermeneutics and things like literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutics, um, exegesis, that type of stuff. So I just want to let you know that this book is over there as well as one from uh, Dr. Fazio. Uh, two commissions uh, based on Matthew, and that also deals with how to interpret uh, the scriptures literally, consistently literally. That's the buzzword right there. Uh, of course, we have another book, too. Many of you know it. just came out called Defining Deception. Um, it's sort of calling out the what's called the modern-day modern, modern day miracle mystical movement or mystical miracle movement. That's what it is. Uh, specifically, a thing called New Apostolic Reformation. Um, also, that book deals with hermeneutics. And the reason why I keep on centering on hermeneutics is because I've said this before, it's, it's sort of a buzz phrase around here among faculty, is that everything boils down to hermeneutics. Okay, Everything, everything we believe, all our theology, everything at its root level comes from an interpretation, how we interpret the scriptures. So at SCS, we are big on hermeneutics. We are big on what we call a consistent, literal, grammatical, historical interpretation. So, that being said, uh, the book's over there, and I uh, hope you guys are blessed today by all the presentations, because all of us are coming at that from different, uh, different angles. All right, so me, Christological doxology, have, does anybody have any idea what that might mean? Yeah, I didn't think so. Um, I didn't either, that's why I put it up, it's just to confuse everybody. <laughs> uh, glorifying God through Christ, how about that? Okay. A hermeneutical case study of John 9 concerning physical handicaps. Now, I don't want to take up too much time before I get into this paper, but a little intro. I had presented this at the Evangelical Theological Society a couple months ago in Phoenix at Grand Canyon University. And um, had some pretty good feedback from that. Um, several of you were there. Tom, you were there. Um, one of our other faculty members was there. And we had some good feedback from some of the people in the crowd. There was one person in particular that had a lifelong disease. And you never know this stuff when you're, have no, you know, I have no idea what anybody's going through or whatever. And he had a, a deformity, some type of deformity. It was actually, it was, it was a mental thing that was going on. And this particular presentation was actually, although it's academic, it's scholar, it ministered to him 
because I'm going to make the case using a consistent, literal, grammatical, historical interpretation and through the Greek text that God ordains, decrees, these are different buzzwords, some would say allow, but some God actually creates or decrees people to be born, even with a lifelong deformity, not for any no not for no purpose, but for the purpose of glorifying God. And that's what we see with a man born blind. So I'm gonna get started here. <clears throat> In John 9, verses 2 to 4, Jesus gets hung on the horns of a false dilemma when his disciples asked him for the reason why a man suffered from congenital blindness, that is being born blind. He's the only one in the entire New Testament who's actually born with this deformity, if you want to call it that. Rather than accepting his disciples' premises, Jesus asserts a third option, and that is that God be glorified through it. Thus, the man's lifelong handicap provided a powerful and public catalyst for God to be revealed in Jesus as the light of the world. In John 8, 12, Jesus gives that great self-predicated I am, ego in me, I am the light of the world. In John 9, he actually shows what that looks like with a man born blind, gives him light, gives him sight. So here we go, through Christological doxology through suffering. However, there are certain Johannine scholars, that is, scholars devoted to the Gospel of John and John's writers, Johannine scholars. They do not favor the traditional English punctuation of verses 3 and 4, which take the Greek construction in its plain sense, holding disdain for implications concerning God, evil, and suffering. Some scholars choose to repunctuate verses 3 or 4, and thus bypass what they consider to be an unthinkable act attributed to God, namely that God would actually determine a man to be born blind for the one day, for the purpose of one day healing him. That rubs people the wrong way. Scholars, certain scholars. As such, this particular episode in John 9 marks what many to be considered an exegetical and theological problem with one's view of Christian suffering hanging in the balance. With this in mind, this presentation this morning, seeks to answer one hermeneutical, hermeneutical question, when should verse 3 end and verse 4 begin? Now, we're going to get there in John 9. I haven't put it up there yet, but we will get there. Or you can, if you have your Bibles open, you can flip to it now. The following presentation will highlight the trustworthiness of mainline English punctuation of John, uh, John 9, verses 3 and 4, as an accurate reflection of the Greek text. Specifically, the method promoted throughout that I take will be one that takes the grammar at face value against the backdrop of those who do not. In so doing, a defense is made of a consistently literal, grammatical, historical interpretation which reveals that God purposely ordained the man's blindness, and by extension, all congenital physical handicaps endured by believers as a catalyst for carrying a doxological intention and function. Let me skip ahead. Sorry. There we are. Thus, a unique Christology is highlighted in dramatic fashion as Jesus' power of recreating the, the blind man's eyes is showcased. Now, this is an interesting episode. This is not a healing. All right? This is not a restoration to sight. This is a congenital blindness. That means there are no synaptic connections between the cortex of the brain and the retina. So God doesn't just recreate something. He actually creates working eyes. He doesn't restore sight to this man. Very dramatic. Here's our text right here. John 9, verses 9, uh, John 9, verses 1 to 4. As he passed by, that is Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. And the disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Verse 3. Here's our verse right here. Here's the controversy. Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. The controversy is verses 3 and 4. When should this start? When should this start and when should it end? And we're going to see what's going to happen. Some try to put verse 4 into what our translations have as verse 3. So, when it comes to theological interrogations, Jesus will not be backed into a corner. This is true whether the questioners are antagonists with an agenda I think in Matthew 22, the Sadducees send people to kind of trap Christ into a 
into a, a conundrum, you know, whose wife will this brother be in the, in the resurrection? Or even his own disciples, as in this passage. John's gospel gives an example of the latter in verse 2. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who send that this man, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? However, rather than choosing between personal or genetic sin, Jesus presents a third option, verse 3, concerning the man to flan echinetes, born from, uh, blind from birth. That is, that God's power in Christ be shown in him. Very simple if we take that to face value, plain reading. Of course, this miracle was then accomplished when Jesus created the man's eyes in verse 6 and 7, thus demonstrating in tangible form that he is, in fact, the very light of the world. Hermeneutical test. Yet hermeneutical methods are put to the test with a man born blind. I think this is a... a a climax, actually, in the Gospel of John. John 9 seems to be sort of glossed over because it's right in the between, right in the middle of the, of the Gospel. I think this is a high point of John's Gospel. He's trying to make a specific point with this man born blind. Hermeneutics are put to the test. This is because this particular episode marks what some consider both as an exegetical and theological problem, as I mentioned earlier. Here the interpreter is forced between literal and non-literal understandings, and the implications are far-reaching if you just think about it. This is because the interpretive route chosen at this passage affects one's theological beliefs concerning Christians who suffer, Christian suffering. With this in mind, I'm seeking to answer one hermeneutical question. When should verse 3 end and when should verse 4 begin? Against the backdrop of those who oppose traditional English punctuation of the Greek text, my method is one that takes the Greek grammar at face value. I'm constantly going to be hammering that. Thus, a literal grammatical historical approach will be demonstrated as the hermeneutical method that best represents the intention of the original author. It's also the one hermeneutical method that transcends denominations. We're going to see that. It's a hermeneutical method that is not encased in a certain denomination. It transcends them. I'm going to show some guys that, that, uh, that are from different theological persuasions that agree with just a literal hermeneutic with the same result. The result of the evaluation will show that verses 3 and 4 of John 9 are in fact punctuated correctly in the majority of your English translations. And that the purpose of the blind man's congenital deformity was ordained by God in order to one day glorify himself through Christ's healing of it. Now if you just think about it, that doesn't sound too controversial. Maybe you're familiar with this passage. Yeah, God made this guy born, uh, this guy was born blind, one day Christ healed him and that's it. But if we think about it, are we actually willing to say that God ordained this man to be born blind for the one purpose of go through all of adulthood in, in darkness for one day for Jesus to walk by him and heal him. I say yes. Let me see why. So here's the textual problem. This is exactly where we're getting in the weeds here. All right. What did the author intend when he wrote the word Allah, the lighted form? All means the same thing, but in John 9.3. While in 644 occurrences throughout the New Testament, the logical function of this word dictates its dominant usage as contrasting or adversative. That is, its main purpose is to highlight a contrast between two opposing thoughts. As such, it is best translated as but, or rather, or as however, to show contrast. Although this conjunction can more broadly be considered a connective of course, a connective conjunction. It still connects it because it connects one thought to another. Daniel Wallace observes the common function of this particular conjunction, quote, suggests a contrast or opposing thought to the idea which it is connected. So Jesus is making a huge contrast. It was neither this man sin nor his parents, but there's the passion right there Gina was talking about. <laughs> Just came out. But so that the works of the Son of God may be glorified. So the works of God can be displayed in <clears throat> <laughs> it appears to be this con contrasting of two ideas which Jesus highlights in the second half of verse 3. Continuing on with the, uh, the textual problem here. Yet as mentioned earlier, there are, there are some scholars, very reputable scholars, and I say this with a little bit of trepidation. These men that I'm about to talk about, I highly respect. These are incredible Johannine scholars. We can learn much from them. But in scholarship, you, you know, you, you differ on certain things, and this is, this is one of those things right here. So I don't want to say everything these guys say is bad, because they're not. I use their works a lot. They're good. They're wrong here. <laughs> Hermeneutically, the problem can be asked, should verse 4 actually begin with but, with Allah? 
If so, that would cause this conjunction to serve as an introductory rather than an adversative conjunction, which violates, violates its otherwise dominant usage. Theologically, if this conjunction should be repunctuated to actually introduce verse 4 and not keep it in verse 3, where it is in our English translations, for the majority of them, the meaning of the text is altered substantially, and that's the problem. By placing the conjunction all, or but, introductorily at verse 4, rather than, tra- than its traditional placing in verse 3, what would then be bypasses the very reason or purpose for the man's congenital blindness, which is marked by the subordinate conjunction hina, so that, that is, the works of God, eyesight given, be displayed in him. Moreover, such a repunctuation would then change the customary hina function as a subordinate clause into its own independent subject clause. Thus, by placing all introductorily as such, in what I'm going to show, God would not have purposed the man to be born blind in order that Jesus would one day heal him and thus glorify God in the miracle. If this view is to be accepted, then Jesus entirely ignored the implication of the problem by focusing solely on doing works for God. And if this were the case, it would read like this. That's what some will help someone repunctuate the text. Verse 3, neither did this man sin nor his parents. It's its own sentence, right? But so that the works of God may be displayed in him, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is still day. Night is coming when no man can work. You see the difference there? Before, in your English translations, majority of them, neither did this man sin nor his parents, but, but so that the works of God may be displayed in him. It gives the purpose for the blindness. By repunctuating this and putting all, or but, as verse 4, Jesus ignores the purpose of the reason and kind of just dismisses and goes on to just doing works. we got theological presuppositions guiding Jesus, uh, guiding Jesus, guiding exegesis. <laughs> By the way, I assume we all know what exegesis means. We're not saying exit Jesus. We're saying exegesis, a drawing out of scripture, a leading out of the text. That's the word. There are several Yohani scholars who support the view that all would be better placed as introductory conjunction, initiating verse 4, as I had up there. The subordinate conjunction, Hina, would then serve to set up the purpose of Jesus and his disciples working good works to help the man born blind, not giving the reason of why he's born. Anglican scholar, Anglican uh, Yohani scholar Colin Cruz states it this way. Got a quote here. Verses 3 and 4, punctuated as they are in the NIV and most other English versions of the modern Greek text, present an unattractive theodicy. That is a defense of God in the, in the, in the, in the circumstance of evil. How can God be justified with what people consider evil? They imply that God allowed the man to be born blind so that many years later God's power would be shown in the, resurrect, uh, the restoration of his sight. However, it is not necessary to read the text that way. He's not alone. Cruz's sentiments regarding this supposed problem are not new. In fact, in the 1940s, while giving lectures on John's Gospel at the Church of the Open Door in L.A., as well as Westminster Chapel in London, noted British Bible scholar G. Campbell Morgan expressed his disdain for the traditional punctuation of Allah in verse 3. Morgan contended this. Now, check this out. This is what G. Campbell Morgan said about how it it looks in your English translations. Quote, If that punctuation is to be accepted, then Jesus meant that this man was not blind because of his own sin or his parents, but in order to give God an opportunity to show what he could do with a blind man. Great, right? He goes on. I absolutely refuse to accept this interpretation, he says. I venture to repunctuate it, end quote. Along with Cruz and Campbell, Wheaton College professor, uh, actually now he's at uh, Calvin College, uh, Gary Burge, Likewise, dismisses the literal Greek construction and supports repunctuating verses 3 and 4. He says this, quote, The purpose clause of 3b can just as well be applied to 9.4, and no doubt it should, end quote. What is noteworthy regarding these scholars' contention is the common theme running through each of them for rejecting the traditional punctuation in verses 3 and 4. And that theme is not based purely on grammatical historical grounds or inductive exegesis, but rather personal bias. Thus, their hermeneutics at this point, which is generally literal for all three scholars, gets abandoned for a softer theological conclusion. Instead of taking the grammar 
of the text at literal face value, all three scholars expose in their explanations of moving all, or Allah, but to introduce verse 4, a personal distaste for the theological implications of the traditional placing. For instance, here there here's some quotes. Colin Cruz, verses 3 and 4, punctuated as they are, present an unattractive theodicy. Morgan, if that punctuation is to be accepted, that is the traditional placing, I absolutely refuse to accept that interpretation because involved in the proposed answer, excuse me, involved in the proposed answer, meaning what he thinks it should be, the altar placing, is a revelation that blindness from, from birth is not the will of God for any man. Now hold on to that one. I'm going to repeat that one later on. That G. Campbell Morgan is saying that it is never the will of God for someone to be born blind. So let that rumble in your mind for a little bit. That causes all kinds of problems, I think. Burge, while a sound theology cannot doubt God's sovereignty to do as he pleases, thoughtful Christians, I like how he puts that, thoughtful Christians, meaning if you agree with him, right? Thoughtful Christians may see this as a cruel fate in which God inflicts pain on people simply to glorify himself. As can be seen, as can be seen none of these commentators seem to positively consider that God could have sovereignly determined a man to be born blind, that is, congenital blindness, with the distinct purpose of one day glorifying himself through it. Indeed, this basic biblical concept seems repugnant to them. Yet this doxological purpose is what God, in fact, does. It's what he displays when Jesus reveals his own power by recreating the man's eyes, both physical and spiritual. When he recreates his, his eyes, it turns into a spiritual lesson, that great Johannian irony at the end. Although I was blind, I, I can now see, right? <clears throat> Not surprisingly, Reformed scholar William Hendrickson sees no reason to abandon the literal approach at verses 3 and 4 as it relates to God's sovereignty. Hendrickson states the obvious conclusion from it emphasizing the doxological cross, uh, doxology. All things, Hendrickson says, even afflictions and calamities, have as their ultimate purpose the glorification of God in Christ by means of the manifestation of his greatness. I think he's right. He'll abandon the literal interpretation elsewhere as Reformed scholars are prone to do. But here he's right. Of course, when it comes to God's sovereignty, they're going to be very literal on that. Missing from the three non-literal positions of Cruz, Morgan, and Burge. As a profound aspect worth considering this, it seems more plausible that a man healed of a handicap who was known by the community to be born with the condition... <laughs> That is, a man who lived his entire life up through adulthood without sight would serve to more powerfully highlight Jesus' deity than if a man had been healed of a more recent eye injury. Don't you think? I mean, think about it. To witness the healing of an undeniable condition has the tendency to cause people to look outside the natural realm for answers. I mean, indeed, this was not uncommon in Jesus' ministry. For example, an even more dramatic instance with similar language is found just two chapters later with the death of Jesus' friend, Lazarus. Using identical textual markers, John records this in, verse, in chapter 11, verse 38 and 34. When Jesus heard it, that is Lazarus' sickness, he said this illness is not for death, but, Allah, on behalf of the glory of God, so that, you know, the Son of God may be glorified through it. It's John eleven four. And, of course, John would later report that Jesus did, in fact, raise Lazarus from the dead publicly, proving that Lazarus' death was only temporary. So, so what I'm saying is the point made here is whether Jesus' involved, Jesus healing involved a lifelong deformity, as in John 9, or a four-day-old corpse, as in John 11, it is the undeniability of the condition which sets up God's glory to be magnified par excellence. It appears the three non-literal scholars earlier neglected this as a possibility. Yet there is a powerful message here exposed by the literal approach to the text that should not go unnoticed, and it's this. Here's a principle we can grab out of this. Any person who is the subject of a handicap, especially a congenital handicap, carries the honor of glorifying God in ways that one without such a condition would never be able to carry out. That gives a lot of hope for those that have physical deformities, those that are suffering. So those were theological 
presuppositions. What about philosophical presuppositions guiding exegesis? In addition to each of the three scholars' personal biases for repunctuating the text in order to escape the theological implication, each of them make an additional flaw, I think. They seem to equate blindness with evil or suffering. Right? Indeed, this very philosophical presupposition itself should be analyzed. Why is it necessary to consider blindness evil or even painful? What explicit scriptural text can serve to prove that if one is born blind, the person is experiencing some sort of punishment, evil, or suffering? Now, granted, the Bible does not paint blindness in an overtly positive light, yet it equally does not present it as purely evil or suffering either. Oftentimes, perceptions, oftentimes perceptions, flawed as they are by sin, mislead people into thinking they are being punished by God or experiencing some sort of evil episode when they're not. Great quote here. Der, uh, w. Gary Phillips makes a point worth considering. Quote, some things we call evil are simply things which displease us because they hinder the fulfillment of our inflated desires. I think it's helpful to recall that human perception is not the standard by which to judge something as evil. God's word is that standard, backed by a literal hermeneutical method which is embedded in Scripture's perspicuity. Nice little shameless plug I'm going to give for our book. Dr. Jeremiah Muti makes a really good case for the literal hermeneutic being embedded in perspicuity. If the scripture is clear, that implies a literal hermeneutic, which is clear. <coughs> Thus it seems that each of the above scholars attempts to change the traditionally held Greek construction at John 9, verses 3 and 4, hold an assumed bias steering their exegesis. And that's a hermeneutical no-no. Right? We all have presuppositions, we know that, but we've got to recognize them at the outset and try to be as neutral as possible, I would assume, when reading the text. If you don't like the conclusion, that shouldn't change your interpretation of a text. Right? Burge is not alone. Morgan is probably the most dogmatic by boldly asserting, quote, blindness from birth is not the will of God for any man. Okay? Yet in stark contrast to this claim, God himself states in the book of Exodus, Exodus 4.11, who has made man's mouth? Saim in the Hebrew. Who has put in place, who has designated man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Where in this explicit reference to God's sovereignty over bodily handicaps is it remotely imply that God would never will a man to be born blind. The scripture records, in fact, the, or it testifies to the exact opposite. Moreover, where is it inferred that blindness is a form of evil, pain, or suffering? In contrast, the scripture demands kindness toward the blind as a judicial law which Israel was commanded to reflect. Leviticus 19.14 You shall not cause the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. Deuteronomy 27.18 I have up there. Another one. Do not mislead the blind. <clears throat> so, how about the purpose of John 9 revealed? The scriptures are replete with examples showing God is absolutely sovereign over people's handicaps, even when the purpose was not for punishment or suffering. God creates, determines, and sovereignly controls calamities in order to glorify himself. There's many proof texts right there in the Old Testament. So, is God absolutely sovereign over people's handicaps? Yes. Even if that purpose was not for punishment or suffering? Yes. Can God create such calamities in order to glorify himself? Yes. Isaiah 45, 7 is very clear on that. I create light and darkness, right? Or calamities. Again, this is not unusual in the Gospels. As I mentioned earlier, a few chapters after this episode with the blind man, John gives his readers the explicit purpose for why Jesus' dear friend Lazarus was ill. Quote, but when Jesus heard that Lazarus was ill, he said this illness is not for death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. That text is really heavily on my mind. I preached that yesterday in a church, and it's just unbelievable. 
how people just assume, as Christians, if you're in pain or if you have some type of handicap, you're being punished by God. It's incredible. What was the purpose of the cross? Didn't God punish Jesus? Right? For our sins? Therefore, could God have purposed the man in John 9 to be born blind in order that one day he would reveal himself to that particular man and with him the world at large, because it's recorded in the Bible for all of us to see, yes, and it is for this purpose the man's lifelong handicap was decreed by God. Taking in all the above considerations, it seems most appropriate to allow the text to literally speak for itself, even if it leads to an uncomfortable conclusion. As such, John MacArthur, he leaves us with the simplest, clearest option as to why the man was born blind. Quote, God sovereignly chose to use this man's affliction for his own glory. Indeed, this is the only tenable option if the text is read consistently at face value. Consequently, it is worthy for all Christians to consider that a doxological purpose may stand behind every physical handicap from birth to death. Now, while not every believer may experience an immediate or physical healing as the man in John 9 did, Christians can still learn from an example in the text. As the, the blind man, it's an incredible story. He just displays this integrity and, and obedience and worship throughout the entire ordeal. The entire ordeal. And he's interrogated by the Pharisees. His parents throw him under the bus. We don't know who You can ask him. He's of age, all that stuff. He's born in darkness, gets healed, and then gets cast out from the synagogue, which is the entire community. So now he, in a sense... Socially dark, and he still chooses to worship Christ at the end. <clears throat> Christians are likewise called to glorify God through these traits, regardless of any personal discomfort they experience. It is apparent in the New Testament that God holds a special place for those who are able to glorify him through their personal hindrances or suffering, whatever that may entail. Undeniably, the, more, the man born blind is a powerful testimony for all Christians to emulate. In him, we see obedience and worship being key traits of correct Christian living, even when encumbered by lifelong deformity. So, literal method justified. When a literal methodology is consistently applied to this passage in John 9, a simple principle emerges that establishes a powerful Christological doxology. All physical congenital handicaps are under the determination and sovereign control of God and carry with them the grand purpose of magnifying God in Christ through them. It shouldn't be too controversial. Maybe it is to some of you. I think that's a legitimate principle. All physical congenital handicaps, and we can qualify a little more, endured by believers, are under the determination and sovereign control of God and carry with them the grand purpose of magnifying God and Christ through them. A consistently applied face value literal hermeneutic helps remind the interpreter that the text is what speaks, not the interpreter's desires. The text is what it is, and personal biases or presuppositions should never hinder its message, even if left with an uneasy conclusion. Yet this particular episode and conclusion is far from hopeless. I hope I'm getting that across. By way of applying a literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic, the above exegesis has demonstrated that God ordains and uses physical handicaps to serve his greater purpose, just as he did with this man blind from birth. Moreover, he is able to do so without a hint of committing evil. Romans 8, 28, James 1, 13. As such, the traditional placing of all, or but, in verse 3, as reflected in the major English translations, is accurate and trustworthy. Its constrative use helps set up the subordinate conjunction Hina, marking the actual purpose for the man's blindness. That is, that the works of God, as shown in Jesus' miracle, would one day be displayed in him. A consistently literal hermeneutical methodology has therefore been justified. Conclusion. Some of you going like, yes, he's been rambling on too long. Conclusion. When I say conclusion, I've, I've learned. I'm actually going to conclude. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Usually a, a preacher's trait to say, okay, we're winding down and go on for another 25 minutes or so, right? No, this is conclusion. Uh, as this, eva- but the conclusion might take a while. This is the conclusion. As this evaluation has confirmed, hermeneutical methods are put to the test with the man born blind in John 9. Meeting this man blind from birth forces the interpreter to choose between a literal, 
or non-literal approach. And implications are significant, significant, obviously, as one's view of Christian suffering hangs in the balance. It's on the line. While various scholars representing different theological traditions were consulted, only one method demonstrated throughout took the Greek grammar, verses 3 and 4, at face value, regardless of the theological conclusion. And that is the literal grammatical historical method. Representative of this methodology were Andreas Kostenberger. I didn't read his quote, but he was one of them. Uh, William Hendrickson and John MacArthur, all of whom come from different theological persuasions. Because his hermeneutical approach transcends denominational lines because it's based on inductive exegesis, it is the literal, grammatical, historical approach that was demonstrated as the interpretive method best exposing Jesus' intention at John 9, 3, and 4. As such, a Christological doxology emerged throughout, emerged through the physical handicap of the man born blind. Additionally, from this episode, we may infer that all physical congenital handicaps are under the determination and sovereign control of God and carry with them the grand purpose of magnifying God in Christ through them. The end. The end. All right. Any questions? We have some, uh, a few questions before we go on to our next. And we do have a, a roaming mic here we can use. Ooh. See if it works. Put a new battery today. It works. Look at that. Oh, all right. No questions by faculty, by the way. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, thank you so much, Professor Marsh, for the presentation. Um, I have a few questions, and I hope you agree with me. So, in your investigation or in your research, did you see any like, textual variant that would that those um, theologians that you mentioned, like J. Campbell Martin, as the support for their non-literal method? Uh, Is there any issue about the, the textual variants that we have? No, not that I can remember. There is a there is a rating. Let me go so back. Check, check the, the variants. I mean, they're all. I mean, actually, there's actually no variants. Right. As far as I'm From what I've remembered, I'm not checking right now. Yeah. There wasn't. It's an interpretive thing, oh. not a variant. Well, there wouldn't be a variant because the Greek, the original, the autographs, the the original, even the oldest we have, there's no punctuation. It's yeah. just a straight line of uncials, oh, capital right. letters, right? So the. Right. So, but no, but this it's still the same word. So, what it comes down to is the punctuation of it which is later. That's an interpretive issue. Exactly. It's not a textual variant issue. So we're not dealing with a, with a text, textual issue. It's no, it's interpretive. interpretive. It's interpretive, right. Mm -hmm. Right, so what we have here is what the three scholars, who I highly admire and respect, it is a, it is a subjective uh -huh. desire, as I, as I showed. I think their presuppositions are guiding, hey, we don't like the implications that God would actually create a man with a deformity, so we should repunctuate it. That's their reason. It's not based on anything in the text itself. Yeah, so yeah, that, that shows the bias of the, those interpreters that you mentioned. But, um, well, my follow up question would be so, are you trying to fit? Could you walk me through it again once again? So, you're fitting literal translation versus non literal translation, and you're saying that, for example, G. Campbell, Morgan, uh, G. Campbell Morgan's interpretation is non literal? No, I would say. Things like the here the, the the two the two it's the conjunctions that are causing the problem. A literal interpretation. We're going to do exegesis. We're going to see what is the dominant use of this word throughout the throughout the New Testament. We're going to start with that. A la, but 644 occurrences in the New Testament. There's a lot of them. The majority of almost not all of them, but the majority of them are to show contrastive thought. Yeah, be that. All right. Right. Those scholars would right then have a problem. That's, they would try to say, okay, in this instance, it doesn't show contrasting thought of who sinned this man or his, uh, his parents that he, bore, but he should be born blind. They would now say it's introductory, not contrastive. You know, so when Jesus said, well, but so that the works of God may be displayed in him, they're going to say, no, that starts a whole other new sentence, a whole new verse. But so that we can continue doing works, we do it. That would be, I think, you know, it's up for debate. I think that's a violation of literal interpretation. Because you're ignoring the dominant usage of that contrasting conjunction. And it also, by the way, as I mentioned, it puts the Hena Clause as its own independent subclause, uh, which does happen. I mean, A.T. Robertson does mention this happening, and they are in John, but it's very rare. So that means to say, but, so that, starts its own thing. It, it's pretty rare. It's there. They, they, do, they do occur, but it's very rare.
And by the way, the categories that Robertson gives for when that would happen, this particular episode doesn't even come close to any one of those options. Good questions. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Dirk, your faculty. <laughs> then I'll, that'll make it really easy for you. The woman is 40 years old, discovers she's pregnant. The doctor has counseled her that there's a probability that her child will be born with Down syndrome. She walks into your office and sits down crying and says, Pastor, what should I do? Should I get an abortion because of the Down syndrome? How would you answer? If I may, this might take a while. Uh oh. Yeah, two minutes. <laughs> no. That was an easy one. I, th- I don't think there's anything. I-, I don't think. And this is interesting. I mentioned I was, I was preaching yesterday. And it was on the, the, the sickness and death of Lazarus. I did not preach on the resurrection. I stopped short, verse 16, to show that friends of Jesus, those that Jesus loved, get sick and die. Everything against what the modern day, you know, miracle faith healers say, which is why we published that book, Defining Deception. Um, while I was preaching, there was a man with Down syndrome in front of me. And I, like I, I make the case in this, what is to say that one is actually suffering because they're not like us? And say, well, you know, anybody who's from a lifelong, a lifelong hindrance, as I make the case here, and I, and I said it yesterday, has an opportunity to glorify God in ways that someone who just, you know, experienced a recent injury does not. The lifelong, what we call deformity, actually sets up God's glory to be maxed more so than if it was, say, a broken leg or something that got healed. I mean, we're all called to glorify God in our, in our hindrances, our suffering. But one that's born with one, I think, has an incredible opportunity to glorify God in ways that one that has not been born with such a thing. Uh oh. Well, I, I just want to follow up and say that 40 year old woman was my wife. Ah. And she instantly told the, the doctor abortion is not an option. Awesome. And today, our third child is a very bright, capable woman uh, with one and three quarters children. So, excellent. God richly blessed Excellent. Excellent. That if person. you. If you think about it, and Dirk, that's a very good modern, that's a very good, like, flesh out this, this application, this implication. Can we actually trust that God was sovereignly, but let someone be born with, say, Down syndrome? We'd have to say yes and do not abort. Good. Dirk, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, Tom. Uh, I need to hold this closer for the way somebody let me know. Um, I very much agree with your, uh, with your, uh, Presentation. I think that there's a, a, an important element that needs to be taken further. Um, I have a little bit of extended comment. I'm a parent of two special needs children that have lifelong disabilities. So I've wrestled with this one. And uh, the solution, admirable as it may be by the, by the critics who want to repunctuate, doesn't solve the problem. It just kicks the can down the road. That's right. If you believe that the disability came by chance or that God didn't do it solely for his glory, you still face the question of why hasn't my child been healed when sure. I have come with tears, when I've come with pleading, when I've come and broken my heart. It just kicks the can down the road. So if you don't have a disability, perhaps that, that, uh, that other translation appears to solve the problem. But when there's a one percent issue, it's one one percent uh, chance of this happening for everybody else. When it happens to you, it's a hundred percent. It's a hundred percent of your life, and so their solution doesn't solve right. anything. However, if you boldly go and say this is for the glory of God, then you got to wrestle with what does that really mean. And I think the one thing that we don't have to say is that it's only for the glory of God. Well, we have to go further and explain what that really means. We say that this guy was blind solely so that one day he could be healed. It's kind of like somebody uh, out of a thousand people, one guy got picked. Bummer for you, dude. You're the one picked to demonstrate God's glory one day. You got to take one for the team. 
I don't believe that's to be the case. It took me a long time to come to the conclusion that my daughter is actually better off with the condition that she has than if she had been born completely intact. That did not come easily. But so my point is, is that I believe that we're underestimating what it means to have something happen for God's glory. So Christ was glorified by that man's blindness and his glory is so powerful for all of us that it also was for that man's benefit and probably for his parents' benefit and his siblings' benefit and his neighbor's benefit because I also realized over the course of my life that I'm better off because of what happened to my daughter and I felt guilty about that for a long time. And then I, realized, then I came to the conclusion my daughter's better off as well. So I think those critics are underestimating what it means to have something be for the glory of God. That is for Christ, yes. It's also for him. It's probably also for many other people. And that we, if we go ahead and take it further and say, and oh, it's not solely for the glory, but oh, by the way, it's also for his benefit. Yeah, that, Tom, excellent, excellent, excellent points. I have two comments uh, to add to that. One is, we don't know what happened to this man after John 9, right? The, to- the story just tells us what happens for the glory of God. He could have lived an incredible, blessed and prosperous life. We have no idea. But in John, you brought up glory, okay? This is, this is interesting. Do- kavod in the Hebrew, you know, that's where the word comes from. It's like a picturesque word of a weight pushing you down. The manifest presence of God, you bow down, right? Greek, glory, doxa. Now, we think of glory, like what does it mean to glorify God? That's what we're talking about here. Praising God, honoring God, singing to God even. Um, Absolutely, worshiping God, those are all legit. But John, it's one reason I like his gospel so much. He comes at the word doxa, he comes at glory, at least the concept, not just the word, but the concept glory, sort of in a different way. And this speaks to your point. I think with John, it's more of a revealing. Okay. That when God is glorified, he is revealed for who he really is. I think of John 17, the high priestly prayer. Jesus says the night of his arrest, Father, glorify the Son so the Son may glorify you. He's really saying, God, you know, Father, reveal the Son to the world so the Son may reveal it to you. So in this man, he's glorified. So the Son of God can be glorified in Lazarus and the man born blind. That Christ and God in Christ is revealed in a new way, in a, in a, in a powerful way, even through suffering. And that puts a whole new nuance on on. How we think of glory, glorifying God is not just praising him. That is certainly legit. But think of glory as a revealing. It kind of puts a more deeper deeper thought on it. And my second thought about what you just said, Tom, was uh, maybe you guys remember some of the older folks perhaps. In the 80s, there was a popular book by a guy named Harold Kushner, Rabbi Harold Kushner. He was, he was Jewish. Uh, that's it. When, yeah, when bad things happen to good people, Right. And the premise of his book is that, his, from what I remember, this was years ago I read it, his son, I believe, it was one of his, his children, one of his children was dying of cancer and died. I believe it was cancer. And he's wrestling with this. And just like you said, Tom, I agree with you. I said, it's not very comforting to think that um, this might not be under God's sovereign control, determined, you know, determined will. This guy took the route of, if God is the classic problem, if God is all good, then he would stop evil. Right? Or he must not be powerful enough to stop it. Well, this guy landed on, well, he's not powerful enough. He's good. He didn't want my son to die, from what I'm remembering, paraphrasing here. He didn't want my son to die of cancer, but he wasn't strong enough in a sense to be able to stop it. And somehow found some type of comfort in that. I'm thinking, I'm reading this going, this is, this, this is, inc- this is horrible. That's, that, that, that's horrifying to think that there might be something out there, and especially suffering that is not in God's control. Right? So if we realize, especially from a, Passage like this, that they have a suffering has a, a specific purpose, especially from our text of believers, to glorify God, to reveal him. 